Any more to do? I'll, I'll right, introduce yeah. Jan to talk on the. Uh, what's his name? I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> Katharis, is it? Uh, Jandran Kukathas. There you are. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I had been intending to give uh, two talks, but um, uh, they both grew a little, and therefore it wasn't possible to. Uh, it would have been cruel and unusual punishment, which, as you hadn't done anything wrong, wouldn't even count as punishment to give you both of them. Uh, also, the second one um, has been rejected uh, without possibility of revision by a publication that shall remain nameless. Which on, is called? <laughs> on the grounds that it is um, arguably uh, both racist and insulting to all academics who uh, work for the state, and so I've decided to rewrite it to remove any possible ambiguity. <laughs> okay. well, I think we ought to tell, tell Pat to be careful of the... Actually, I fear that Pat might... You know, don't touch the works of art, Pat. Don't touch anything around the work. Uh, right, or, or... OK. <laughs> A critical commentary on Kukarthus's two constructions of libertarianism. Abstract. Kukarthus's alleged libertarian dilemma is introduced and the two key criticisms of it stated. The succeeding critical commentary then makes several main points. Kukarthus's account of libertarianism, libertarianism offers no theory of liberty at all, nor a coherent account of aggression. Consequently, he cannot see that his federation of liberty is not libertarian by basic understanding of morals and non-invasive liberty, still less by a more precise theory of libertarian liberty. In trying to explain his union of liberty, Kukarthus evinces considerable confusion about the nature of libertarianism. His argument that a monopoly legal system is inevitable is also neither plausible nor libertarian. He has apparently overlooked the cogent arguments against Nozicki and Minicky and in favour of anarchy. It is concluded that the neglect of libertarian theories of liberty and anarchy is the underlying problem. Introduction. Kukarthus believes he has discovered a serious and unavoidable dilemma for libertarians. He claims we must choose between one, strictly self-defensive communities in a federation of liberty, with, no possible, uh, with possibly no libertarian communities in the Federation, and two, a centrally authoritarian union of liberty that tolerates no dissent, possibly including that of self-styled libertarians. This article provides a critical commentary on Kukarthus's relevant assumptions and arguments in the order in which he makes them. Uh, the approach is intended to facilitate a comprehensive critique and any comparison between the texts. However, the two central criticisms are that Kukarthus's dilemma arises out of a misunderstanding of libertarian liberty and anarchic law. The Federation of Liberty. This means I'm quoting. Kukarthus first gives an account of libertarianism. Unfortunately, this is typical in being without a theory of interpersonal liberty that explicitly relates the various things that libertarians believe. His article thus both fails as a philosophical account of libertarianism and helps to set him up for the dilemma that he thinks he has discovered. For he tells us that there are at least two very different societies which might be constructed out of such libertarian first principles. And it must be asked, first, which of these is the one that libertarians ought to prefer? And second, whether either of them is wholly acceptable from a libertarian point of view. He says at least two very different societies, but also he, he, his whole paper is supposed to be demonstrating there, that there are also, at most, two kinds of libertarian societies, so presumably there are two. The first imagined society is called the Federation of Liberty. In this society, it is recognised that aggression is fundamentally wrong. But then Kukarthus gives a definition of aggression that simply will not do if it is intended to be a clear account of what libertarians are against. Aggression is recognised to mean the initiation of the use or threat of physical force against the person or property of someone else. 
This won't do for libertarian purposes for two main reasons. One, a thief, embezzler, fraudster, etc., does not need to engage in the initiation or use of, sorry, of the use or threat of physical violence against the person or property of someone else. For instance, if someone steals your garden gnome, then no kind of physical violence against you or your gnome has thereby occurred by any normal usage of these words. Uh, my point is that Kukarthas' account of is that Kukarthas' account of the non-aggression principle or liberty itself is incoherent as it stands. There can be a coherent account, but it is not as simple a matter as some libertarians believe. Two, libertarian policing services, when dealing with a non-violent thief, embezzler, fraudster, etc., will in themselves engage in the initiation of the use or threat of physical violence against the person or property of someone else. For instance, they will engage in this initiation against the peaceful gnome thief if they arrest him. The usual defence of libertarians without a theory of liberty is to ignore normal English usage and insist on Pickwickian definitions of the words so that the entirely non-violent gnome theft counts as the initiation of the use or threat of physical violence but the police arresting and incarcerating the police, peaceful thief doesn't count. And there are two main problems with this. First, people who genuinely wish to make clear sense of libertarianism cannot do so, at least until they acquire an adequate theory of liberty or aggression as the opposite of liberty. And second, critics of libertarianism can and often do make philosophical hay with such confusion. I've often written on this subject, but I'm obliged to return, it, to return to it when it crops up again as a problem, which is very often. Why does this matter here? Kukarthas helps to perpetuate an important incoherence dressed up as a simple principle about the nature of liberty or non-aggression, which needs to be corrected whenever it occurs. And, as I hope to show, Kukarthas' muddled conception pervades his article and helps to obscure the mistake in his alleged dilemma. Kukarthas summarises the Federation of Liberty by saying, in other words, it recognises two central axioms, the right to self-ownership and the right to homestead. Again, this is recognisable as what is called libertarianism, but there is no theory of liberty to explain exactly how these two things are libertarian or to apply to any problem cases that might arise such as Kukarthas' alleged dilemma. The question is then posed, what should be libertarians' attitude to those who disagree with libertarian principles? And the answer given in the Federation of Liberty is, if they are numerous enough, they might form their own communities or groups and live by their own lights. If they will not aggress against libertarians, then libertarians will not ag aggress against them. The consequence of this attitude might well be that there are quite a few groups or communities in which the freedom of the individual to dissent from the community's powerful authorities is not respected or even conceded. Indeed, the freedom of the individual to leave the group or community might not be accepted, so that many people are effectively held within the community against their will. The crucial question here is, is this a consequence that is compatible with genuine libertarianism? And here I suggest the clear answer is no. Libertarianism is not a personal matter. Insofar as it is held as a moral theory, it is categorical, not a matter of mere preferences, and universal, including all relevant moral agents, which usually means all people. It would indicate confusion if one were to say that X is immoral for some people, but not for others. Unless where one, one were to believe that there are two types of people and they are not moral equals. For instance, as Aristotle thought that some people were natural slaves. So unless one does believe that some pe people are not entitled to liberty, then infringing liberty is immoral for me and immoral for you, and immoral in my community and immoral in yours. Consequently, Libertarians cannot forbid 
people in community A from assisting someone whose liberty is infringed just because he is in community B that is not itself threatening the liberties of community A. Libertarianism is about the interpersonal liberty of everyone. It is not only about the liberties of individuals already in libertarian communities. And if it were, we might have a problem as we do not live in such communities ourselves. Of course, we are not obliged to help protect the liberty of others either. And even if we would like to help, we might see that we would do more harm than good. But these are separate matters. The point is that it cannot go against libertarianism as such to liberate some oppressed individual, even though he does not, and maybe cannot, explicitly ask or appoint us to help, solely because his society is not itself threatening our societies. Kukarthus says uh, of an individual that in self-defence, he can appoint an agent, or indeed many agents, to act on his behalf. Uh, but he can only do that if he knows about them and if he can communicate with them. And if, and if he can't, then apparently tough luck. The attentive listener might have noticed that I have made this argument without appealing to a theory of liberty, despite having stated that such a theory is required. I have done this by appealing to certain ideas and intuitions about liberty and also morality, rather as Kukarthas did. But to be fully cogent, we do in need, indeed need some such theory. Otherwise, we cannot really assess whether the argument is sound. We will also leave ourselves open to someone from a liberal community producing a theory of liberty that ostensibly puts us in the wrong uh, and that we will be unable to answer satisfactorily. It will not surprise people who know my writings to hear that I theorise interpersonal liberty as the absence of proactive impositions. I cannot go into the detail of that theory and its defence here. Suffice it for now to say that it minimises overall proactive impositions for people to own themselves except in some highly unrealistic thought experiments. Therefore, one does not proactively impose on anyone, let alone a whole community, by rescuing someone who is being proactively imposed on in some community, even if the rest of the community chooses to work themselves into a frenzy of outrage about the interference in their traditional customs of sooty or slavery or stoning, etc. And so not only self-defence, but the even unrequested or appointed defence of others is clearly allowed by libertarianism. Those in the Federation of Liberty are mistaken in thinking that it is a libertarian principle that it simply is not permissible to initiate the use of force against others who are not threatening to use force against you or your property. Kukarthus rightly observes that under this understanding of libertarianism, it is possible in principle that no one accepts the principles of libertarianism. The principle of non-aggression operates only between groups or communities. And he asks, can this really be a libertarian society? And I answer, no, it cannot. Kukarthus has provided a reductio ad absurdum of this interpretation of libertarian principles. The union of liberty. A second society is now imagined, the union of liberty. The setup is the same, except that the principle of libertarianism is not one that people may choose not to adopt. The principle holds for all persons in their dealings with all persons. What is the point, after all, of a moral principle that does not apply to all? Quite, or more precisely, how is it a moral principle at all? Carthus then asks, what is the implication of this for the kind of society that will emerge? And we then again see the sort of confusion that results when someone uses his intuitions about liberty instead of applying an explicit theory of liberty. For Kukarthus thinks that it is possible that some people might agree with one another to form associations in which they live voluntarily by non-libertarian principles. They might agree to hold their property in common and limit private ownership. They might place restrictions on speech 
or require all to abide by strict rules limiting what may, each may do and authorising some to hold considerable power over the others. On the contrary, say I, none of these agreements amount to people living by non-libertarian principles in the sense of people interfering with their liberty or proactively imposing on them. They are, presumably, all contractual agreements. So if they flout liberty, then it would seem that all contracts flout liberty. However, Kukarthus explicitly rules slave contracts as being non-enforceable because of non-aggression. And this is a further confusion, as it is not aggression to enforce a contract. But I won't elaborate on this more controversial issue here. Therefore, it is a conceptual muddle to state that no one is permitted to live without liberty unless he has explicitly relinquished those particular liberties he lacks. Part of the problem here is probably a common equivocation between two completely different conceptions of interpersonal liberty. One, liberty understood as not suffering any aggression, the non-aggression principle, or initiated invasions or interferences by other people. Only this is the libertarian conception. And two, liberty is understood as not being constrained by other people in any way whatsoever. And this entails that a gain in liberty by one person is a loss in liberty by another. Hence, I call this zero-sum liberty. Now, Kukarthus supposes that he spots a problem. There are a great many communities and associations which operate without respecting the principle of liberty or which violate the requirement of consent. True. But he then goes on to say, most obviously, most dealings with children invariably involve some restrictions on their liberty and usually without children's consent. However, most self-identified libertarians themselves advocate some paternalistic restrictions on liberty for children, decreasing in proportion as children approach their adult maturity. There is some disputed age or level of maturity below which libertarians typically think it at least acceptable and possibly even a duty forcibly to prevent a child from running across a busy street, going off with an unknown adult offering him enticements, putting his, putting his hand into a wood chipper, eating a known poison, etc. However, the age of non-paternalism can be low. David Friedman, for, for instance, suggests that any child above some very low age, say nine years old, who is willing to arrange for his own support should be free from the authority of his parents. Anyway, these restrictions <laughs> might sometimes have culturally relative aspects, higher in some societies and lower depending on what's usual there. So this example is of a limited use in clarifying the problem that Kukarthus is trying to explain. He is on firmer ground when he says that some communities might restrict the application of the principle of liberty on the basis of gender or ethnicity or religion or sexuality. But exactly where is the problem with the idea that liberty must be enforced? Kukarthus, Kukarthus thinks that the first and fundamental implication is that there can be only one authoritative understanding of liberty. I disagree. Competition seems more likely and more desirable. Second, and following from this, there cannot be a multiplicity of authorities with the right to set standards of conduct. Surely there can, but they cannot set different standards without risking clashes that would need to be dealt with in some manner. Some manner. Further, it is permissible to intervene in the workings of communities or associations which do not respect libertarian principles. Permissible, yes, but neither compulsory nor always prudent. Kukarthus continues, if intervention in the affairs of people who have not aggressed against us is permissible to stop aggression within their own community, this must either be because anyone may determine whether or not intervention is justifiable or only when it is authorised as lawful to intervene. 
But, say I, these are neither the only nor the right options. For if anyone correctly determines that an intervention is libertarian, then an intervention is permissible and lawful. And if some alleged authority mistakenly determines that it is not libertarian, then an intervention is still permissible and lawful. We cannot rule out a disagreement between some individuals and those who think they are the ones who decide what is authorised as law lawful. But what happens then? Kukarthus incorrectly con concludes that intervention is permissible only when it is lawful and authorised as such. I say this because I am assuming that a libertarian society is a society under law. I regard this attitude to law as mistakenly deferential and implicitly statist. A libertarian, but especially an anarchist, would be unlikely to view a libertarian society as being under some particular system of law any more than as being under some particular system of money. It is not under law because the law is not above the people and aggressively dictating what is allowed as the law is with the state. The law is a market-produced service at the level of individuals, merely protecting them and their property from aggression. If some alleged authority makes an error about what is libertarian, then it is de jure permissible to ignore this authority on that error. And only that attitude can hope to preserve a libertarian society from degenerating into hierarchical conformity with whatever some alleged authority decrees. Kukarthus then asks, but what law is this? He concludes that the union of liberty must prescribe what standards every community must meet if it is to pass the libertarian test, for no non-libertarian community may operate. However, this way of expressing things gives the erroneous impression that the union of liberty must be committed to worldwide invasion of all allegedly non-libertarian societies, which sounds like a recipe for endless wars. In reality, the union of liberty is merely committed to the permissibility of rescuing any individuals who are being aggressed against in other societies. And of course, this is only as long as it is not counterproductive, which it often is. Hence, the liberal tradition of non-intervention. And that does not sound alarming in the slightest. Rather, it sounds both moral and prudent. This is not how Kukarthus sees things. He states that the implication of this is that there will be a central judicial body with final authority to determine when intervention is permitted, also who may rightly intervene. But this is all based on the hierarchical error we have just observed. And so we do not need to go on to agree that there would be a strong central authority that is more likely to be captured by the powerful groups or communities and end up depriving people of their wish to live by dissenting moral standards, even if they are dissenting libertarian moral standards. Consequently, we do not need to choose between these two interpretations of the Federation of Liberty, which can in principle turn out to contain no communities of that federation which actually value or respect liberty, and the union of liberty, which can in principle turn out to be a society ruled by a strong authority with little respect for dissenting moral traditions, including some self-styled libertarian moral positions, traditions. <coughs> Kukarthus has produced a bogus dilemma. Conceptual space. Kukarthus concludes, Alas, as I see it, no other construction of libertarian, libertarianism is possible. The two alternatives described here occupy all the available conceptual space and there is no third way, theoretically speaking. Libertarians must bite one bullet or another. On the contrary, as we have seen, there is no conceptual space for either of Kukarthus's interpretation of these two constructions in libertarian terms. Moreover, correctly understood, 
a libertarian society remains viable with slightly varying conceptions of liberty being enforced by different protection and arbitration agencies, plus the possibility of prudent intervention in non-libertarian societies. Kukarthus himself opts for the Federation of Liberty, giving the reason that power ought not to be entrenched. No power should be established as the final court of appeal from which no dissent is possible, as it would be in the Union of Liberty, according to him. But this final court of appeal is not a plausible interpretation of how a Union of Liberty, or at least a realistic libertarian society, would likely operate. Kukarthus's main error here appears to be a statist presupposition. His article does not consider anarchy. It is not even directly mentioned. The state and government are mentioned several times each and not in any critical or cautious way. An example is where he writes of the libertarian account of the justification for and role of the state. Except for one bracketed aside, for some libertarians, no government is legitimate. The idea that there might not be a state does not occur. This is hard to explain or excuse in an article on the best way to maintain a libertarian society, especially as anarchy is the third way and it solves the underlying problem. It prevents there from being a strong central authority. A modus vivendi between communities with slightly different conceptions is far more likely. Kukarthus appears to take the view that the consequence of differing interpretations of libertarianism must lead to either serious conflict or a single higher authority, and that the single higher authority must win out. But this is analogous with Nozick's view on how states evolve out of anarchy, and it is mistaken for the sorts of reasons that Roy Childs, Murray Rothbard and various other libertarians have explained. In short, it is more than likely that clashing defence companies and their customers will strongly prefer arbitration to violence. And it is the fallacy of composition to think that because all clashing defence companies must agree to some arbitration agency, therefore they must all agree to the same arbitration agency, <coughs> which thereby establishes monopoly, uh, a monopoly that is supposedly one step away from being a state. Moreover, a business is always reliant on giving an economic service to its customers. It is not based on the authority to rule as the state is. Therefore, even if one dominant dominant arbitration agency were to arise, there is no natural likelihood for it to slide from being a business into being a state. Conclusion. It is of course possible that I have misread Kukarthus or failed to see the force of his arguments. But unless and until I am corrected, I am obliged to conclude that there is no problematic dilemma for libertarians concerning the best type of libertarian society. Neither of Kukarthus's options is libertarian, as he might see if he had a clearer conception of non-invasive liberty. And the anarchic alternative remains not merely conceptually possible, but entirely practical, as Kukarthus might see if he were not to ignore it. There is, however, clearly a problem in persuading political theorists to take seriously Libertarian Theories of Liberty and Anarchy. Thank you. Are there any questions or uh, comments to make? Is there somewhere we can download that? Is there, is it going to be available on the internet anywhere? Uh, it may well be available. Well, it'll, it'll be published eventually, but I can send you a copy if you give me your email address. Yeah. Okay, I'll yeah. do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Um, oh, was that a, a really an excellent uh, philosophical critique of uh, Carcass's views? I'm really, I'm really quite impressed by that. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> um, but the, 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 the editor who looked at this said this is just a, a, a stream of ideas with no connections yeah. whatsoever. Who was it? Was it this is an anonymous reviewer. Carry on. Um, but, um, Carry on with your um, praise. But, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> the, um, I thought you finished the place. As usual, you managed to, you, yeah. you managed to get the, uh, the absolutely philosophically uh, pre- correct position spot on. The, the problem d- does arise there with various practical problems. There are, there are dilemmas that arise there. Um, one of the dilemmas is how, what, what attitude the, the correct minded anarchist libertarian should take towards the way pro- public property is concerned. For instance, we have Emma West, yeah. uh, who famously rode a tube train and uh, drunkenly shouted out a lot of racist abuse. Uh, and this was captured on his mobile phone put on YouTube when she was arrested and I believe actually imprisoned for this. Um, now, some people might say, well, yeah, the, the tube has the right to set its own standards and rules and so forth, and if she broke whatever rules the tube sets, you know, it doesn't matter what the, you know, the law, I mean, the, the end of the tube would set. Although, say, Sean Gabb famously, uh, or rather notoriously, always says, no, well, no, we should always sign the you know, never mind the niceties of who might own what or what the authority is. We should all aside with the uh, the politically incorrect or the anti-statist view and see her as a dissident. And even if some, even if even if a political dissident is in some way actually transgressing against a formal yeah. property right, we should actually still support the dissident rather than be precious about property rights. Yeah. One possible. I mean, uh, on that particular point, mm. I, uh, any who ran a public transport is going to try and please their customers. Yeah. So it's likely to say, when well, anybody who abuses the customers is going to be thrown off the bus. Uh, but we're not going to incarcerate them and make a citizen <laughs> arrest and fine them and mm. send them to prison at vast public expense for months. But, but uh, it's probably enough to just chuck them off the bus and quite reasonable and, and just... Yeah, I, think, I mean, you've said before that you think the best thing to do is, well, the solution we should prefer is try to imagine what the best mark, not often people get sucked into being a taking politically correct issue, but you always say that the uh, best thing is to try and imagine what the market might realistically do. In some places, it's more easy to do that than others. But yeah. That's probably the right attitude to take. Uh, and another one regarding uh, federalism and invasion things is uh, something that the, the Lee Rockwell, in, uh, Lee Rockwell.com, or the Mises Institute, mm-hmm. is that they often try to try and try and worm their way out of various socially awkward um, questions for them, is to place a great emphasis on states' rights and federalism. And so if there's, mm. if there's a particularly difficult question that uh, might displease some conservatives or socialists or whatever, or feminists, uh, they try to say, uh, well, well, we'll leave it to the states. Usually they often say it's about things like abortion <laughs> or uh, less controversial, perhaps, sodomy laws. And there was a bit of a, a, bit of a, com- a, bit of a Bit of an argument on on the on the Mises Institute website, where in Texas apparently it was uh, illegal to have uh, homosexual sodomy. Mm. Somehow the Texas police found out that the two men were doing this in their own home and arrested them and prosecuted them and convicted them. And they went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court of the United States overruled the Texas authorities and said, "No, no, you mustn't do this." They, mm. they, invented probably some right in the Constitution by reading it into it, but said, no, uh, you've got to release them, this is wrong. Now, some people took the attitude, well, no, uh, even though it might in libertarian theory, it's not controversial that sodomy between consenting people should be perfectly legal. Mm-hmm. We should not be supporting, however, uh, a massive invasion, a power grab by the federal government. That's, that we shouldn't be supporting that. The alternative point of view, uh, one I favour, is that there's nothing wrong in, even though the federal government might be a big criminal, mm. you can still use a big criminal to fight off a smaller criminal in the circumstances. If you're being, you know, robbed in the street, mm. somebody comes and rescues you, the fact that they might have committed other crimes is neither here nor there. They're still rescuing yeah. you mm. on that particular occasion. But the point is, you know, is it, is it, is it, is it all right? You know, what would be the correct attitude about that? Is it, is it a power grab by the federal government that we should be more concerned about? Or should we be more concerned about the immediate liberty of the two people involved, for instance? It, when, when, it, when it comes to talking about uh, real political systems, uh, uh, I'm reluctant to get drawn in to the debate mm. uh, because I think it's uh, you're on a hiding to nothing. Uh, I mean, obviously, when Kukarthas talks about the union of liberty, the federation of liberty has in mind is something <coughs> like the American system. Yeah. Uh, the libertarian... Uh, scenario that fits this best, I think, is if there are people who are uh, so vehemently against 
abortion, homosexuality, whatever, they simply got to go somewhere and buy up the land and then living there is a contractual condition that these things, you won't do these things. And if you do, you're contractually going to be punished in such a way. Well, you know, you know don't go and live there if you don't like it. But um, and I think that would just, that solves the problem quite easily. I don't, but they're not going to be that many. I mean, how many people are so obsessed with the idea of uh, what their neighbours are getting up to in bed that they say, no, 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 I will only move into an area where there's a... Well, <laughs> if they really want to, they can, but the, the, then they'll have to pay the full cost of it. And the full cost of it is a lot more than it is when you can just do it via political means and impose it on a whole group of people and you're not bearing the cost yourself. You, you've got to buy up the land. Some people will certainly do it as regards, say, for instance, we want to live in an Islamic area, a Jewish area, a Mormon area. They'll, they'll, they'll do it. They do but do I it. Don't, they do do it. They're not very large areas for the most part. And, and they're very easy to avoid. So if you want to, don't want to cross them... Well, they're quite easy to avoid. Hang on, but first of all, there's uh, David, and then this chap here, and then you... Sorry, Sorry. Just picking up on what you said just now, uh, so what, what do you say then to those who say, well, yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, the correct response is uh, if you don't like the rules, don't live there. So what's the response then to those who say... If you don't like living under the British state, don't live there. On the no. basis that the British state effectively owns the land, it can make rules, so on and so forth. Because it wasn't set up on a, in a libertarian manner, simple as that. Um, had it been, uh, it's hard to see how it could have been in real terms, then that, then it would be a fair enough remark. But otherwise, it, it makes as much sense as saying, uh, if you don't like the mafia, don't live in Italy. But because you more or less... You, you tacitly contract to accept whatever the mafia do by living in Italy. No, you don't. They, they just, they, they're just they an imposition. Follow-up question, then. Do you see any limits to, uh, to the uh, scope of con contractually enforceable agreements relating to living in a particular place? I mean, if... You know, There's going to be very difficult cases that have to be tested in, in court and on the basis of uh, libertarian theory, I think. And there's also a problem with what counts as contracting in. Uh, if, you, if you go into an area where they say, uh, right, that you're in an Islamic area, shoplifters will have their hands chopped off and you go in that area and you shoplift. Have you contracted in? Um, I'm inclined <coughs> to think that you, that you haven't, but... Um, uh, because you don't contract into something just by uh, breaking the rules. Uh, but th that, that, that's a whole big other argument, yeah. Uh, yeah like you, I was a puzzled as to why the compass ends up going for the position for which he appeared to have um, produced a reductive observer. Um, he, he, he does, and it's what, but I was even more puzzled by the fact that he appears not to have noticed the other big problem, so this is this is the federation of the things, which is a, all, it, it is it's supposed to be a conceptual possibility of this federation that it can consist entirely of groups, none of which have any interest in living internally, and this would seem to make the establishment of what, whatever the overall constitution is supposed to be supposed to establish such a federation, um, not just fantastically unstable but hugely implausible. Can't see how we got there in the first place, and you can see how it was very, very easy to go right? And this, this struck me as if had a kind of anarchy point, possibly said. And this struck me as being a big problem is you also have an anarchism anarchy. In general, I'm not amazingly persuaded by the rock bar arguments that um, private defense companies will be put in to be tentacles of trade, or that private defense companies are what you'll mainly get when. Uh, what you're looking for is what prevails in terms of force. So, and I, and I thought the, the interesting thing about his paper and the interesting weakness of it, you, you didn't focus on perhaps, maybe, maybe you share his confusion, is that, that that was it, that he spelled out one of the weaknesses of anarchy and then appeared to be persuaded by it or not to have Well, he thought it was the lesser evil. He says, you've got to choose one or the other and it's a lesser evil. I mean, he didn't notice it, but the, the, the problem is he didn't notice, he just thought the problem is, the problem in federations. You won't have that much liberty around. But yeah, the other problem is you might not have what's and a complete repudiation of liberty and no federation at all. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're all these all these little separate societies. 
internally, in, in, in which internally Libya didn't prevail, but they're somehow going to maintain this kind of. Um, in fact, it starts a bit like the Westphalian system now, I think of it, because they kind of establish these rules which are effectively boundary conditions for these states within which are these communities, within which are in the internality. It's not the first time I've noticed libertarians or the anarchists accidentally disclose what seems to be one of the main disabling problems. So the main disabling problem being... Problems with anarchy. It doesn't really, it doesn't actually deal, I know people have written on it, but I'm persuading them. The problem of security. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with Mozik with lots of what he said rather than write by him. Be, uh, for, for the sort of reasons that Nozick gives about uh, uh, in, in Anarchy State and Utopia. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think probably we can't go into those in detail here just because that's too far outside the scope of what MacArthur said. I mean, it's, it is interesting that. Um, I wonder why he wrote this thing. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's almost as though it's supposed to be a, a reductio ad absurdum of libertarianism, but, but without admitting that fact, he's saying, uh, he's saying well, I will opt for, uh, here's two unacceptable possibilities and I, I opt for this unacceptable possibility, but you've got to have one of them. And uh, it just makes libertarianism look rather uh, unattractive. Uh, and I think the reason is that he's not a libertarian. And it's it's um, it's difficult to defend libertarianism well <laughs> unless you're sympathetic to it, and he isn't really that sympathetic. He's a classical liberal, uh, and and therefore he finds it hard to defend libertarianism. This is this is actually well, a, this he, is an attack. I assume I take it from what I read, from what from what I've heard, of, and therefore finds it hard to defend libertarianism. <laughs> a classical liberal, classical liberalism is broader than libertarianism. Libertarians are anarchists or minarchists. Anarch classical liberal is much broader and would include people who think the state should provide education and all kinds of weird things. Adam Smith actually talks about state subsidy of competing religions in um, wealth of nations. Really. See a fire. Bizarre, you know. So, yeah, so Hayek is not a libertarian. He's a classical liberal. Cla libertarian, I was discussing this the other day with David. Uh, libertarianism is a subset of classical liberalism. All libertarians are classical liberals. Not all classical liberals are libertarians. So, now, okay. I think to an extent some of my questions uh, I sort of uh, what's already been answered. Um, you'll have to forgive me, I'm kind of unfamiliar with a lot of this material, so I'm coming to this fairly new. Um, one of my objections to the um, uh, the idea of the Islamic society in which uh, they do claim the right to chop people's hands off, or to the objections that people have, you know, sort of, if you don't like the UK, you're always free to leave. Mm. What's really being claimed within these areas is not particularly ownership of the area itself, but ownership of the people within the area. It's effectively a, a claim of property over the people. When you claim the right to chop someone's hands off, you're actually claiming a higher authority over their body than they themselves have. Um, especially, I mean, sort of, uh, and again, in the, uh, the case of people who are living within the UK or living in the United States or living within any individual state. Yeah. The people have absolute rights over their own lives and their own bodies and what they do for themselves. Mm. Um, what's really being claimed when you sort of say that you can't take drugs or you're not allowed to engage in these kind of sexual right, mm. you know, sexual acts or yeah. this or that, is you're really saying you have a greater authority over their body, not over the area itself. If you claim an earth authority mm. over the area, yeah. you have the right to reject the people from the area. Yeah. And that's the whole of the right that you have. Uh, but you don't have any right to do anything beyond that, I would say. I mean, I'm inclined to agree in the sense that if you find yourself, say, born into a, a particular area and then you disagree with it, um, it, given that it was all set up on a voluntary basis in the first instance, I think you probably got to get out. Uh, you, it's a bit odd to just stay there and say, no, I, I know this is an Islamic area, but uh, I, I refuse to obey the, the rules. I think, given that if they really did buy all the land 
and you've got the rest of the world, you've got some obligation to get out. But at the same time, uh, they also have some obligation to allow you to get out. They can't say, no, 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 you're Islamic, and if, you, uh, if you're an apostate, we're going to kill you. Uh, when you say, well, I never, I never, I never contracted in, I, I don't want any part of it. They have to let you out. But I think you have some duty to leave it, rather than just stay and uh, interfere with them. I mean, that's the whole beauty of libertarianism, really, is, is that you can, you can just go your separate ways and you don't become uselesses to each other. Yes. Um, have you finished? I was going to... Well, to, let, um, to, it's best to let him carry on more with yeah. the topics. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you afterwards. In yeah. the case of someone being born into a particular area, um, I think what we really have to, to look at is what claims are being made about the ownership of the area in which they're happening to reside. Uh, and for the, uh, for the case of the United Kingdom, having been born in the United Kingdom, yeah. I have just as great a claim on the United Kingdom as a particular piece of land uh, as anyone else has. So no one in that area has the right to say that we're going to stay and you have to leave. Because exercising that claim, making that claim, is effectively saying that my ownership right, which is exactly the same claim of right that they have, is in fact null and void just because there's more of them than there are of me. Yeah. So in terms of uh, communal ownership of particular areas, when it comes down to, to sort of, uh, property that's owned uh, jointly, anyone who becomes a member of the group should have a joint, an equal say in what then happens within that area. Um, in terms of private property, where people have bought property from the state within that area, that then is effectively, if the state's saying this is yours, uh, then that should be theirs and be recognised as being theirs no matter what. So what well, I've, got, I've a problem with the state giving away something that it has no right to in the first place. I mean, and... Uh, uh, as regards, uh, you know, but living in the UK, I mean, who, uh, apart from your own home, do you have a, a right to any part of the UK? I don't see that. Well, you... I have as much right to the whole of the UK as everyone else who was born in the UK has. Well, in fact, yes, namely property none. Rights, property rights, well, yeah. yeah I mean, uh, but property rights are effectively a claim, and it's kind of a polite claim, and it's polite. Uh, respectful to recognise yeah. someone else's claim of property if it's legitimate. Yeah. It's kind of like I'm sitting on this chair now, so in a sense I can claim that this chair is mine. It's not entirely mine in the fact that when I go from here, I shouldn't take it with me. Mm. But at the same token, whilst I'm sitting on it, no one should yank it away from underneath yeah. me. Um, it's am I being a bit sort of vague and rambling? <coughs> no, it's just perfectly all right, but I suppose you ought to be fun now. It's perfectly all right, we could have first done. Sorry. Yes. Okay, yeah, no. sure. This follows on a bit from what you were saying, in fact. Yeah. Um, I haven't read this essay by Cook Arthurs. So, have, have I got this right? That his main argument is between um, individuals and their right to be free and the rights of uh, communities not to be interfered with by the state, and, and you've got to come down on one side or the other. Are you against the state, or are you in favour of individuals? Uh, uh, that... Well, I, either, right. either we have communities which have their own rules, and nobody can interfere with those communities unless they attack your community. You can't interfere with them, no matter what they do in their community. Yeah. You can't interfere, which doesn't look very libertarian. Or he says there has to be one ultimate authority that says this is what is libertarian everywhere and we will impose it everywhere yeah. that we possibly can uh, those he sees those as the only two possible options okay so to take a, a kind of real world example yeah do, do you remember um there was an asian girl who's murdered by her parents yeah which is called shafina ahmed yeah say you're a, that's the situation this um Muslim girl is being threatened by her parents and they kill her. Yeah. What practical steps do you take? Do you get the state to get involved and, and give her... Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the state to, 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 to be involved, no. But, I mean, I think anybody has a right to help her. Uh, uh, and, um, I mean, one of the reasons that, pe that people have less help, perhaps, is because they think, well, it's, you know, it's up to the social services to do it. Yeah. But the social services are hopeless. If it, if it weren't, if the social services weren't there, people would be more likely to think, well, 
I suppose I have to do something if I care because there is no one else and uh, anybody could have could have helped her. Uh, and also, in a libertarian society, she'd be more likely to realise she could just walk out the door. And yes. Leave the family. I think one well, because it would be uh, it would be part of the culture that you just saw on the newspapers, television, every all the time that there were these all these different kinds of societies. And if you happen to be living, for instance, in a Muslim area, mm-hmm. let's say she was because because her parents wanted to. She would just say, "Okay, I'm out of here," and she just walks over the border, and that's it. You know. Now, of course, they might try and pursue her. There's a problem with um, what rights parents have over children. That I mean, I just touched upon. For instance, um, obviously, you know, it's a very sensitive area. Do you have a right to cut your infant son's foreskin off, given that it's done by? Uh, Muslims and Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people say, well, you, you know, we could, we'd rather leave that one alone because, you know, uh, we're, other, we're, we're going to be taking on the whole Islamic world if we're going to say you can't do that. But but there was a, in the newspaper today, um, a woman was arrested for giving her 11 year old daughter a tattoo. That's right. And I think someone got taken to court in Germany. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you say, well, a tattoo, what about um, if, you, if, if you pierced her ears? But it's, and so there's sort of this cultural aspects here, and where you've got difficult cases, then I suppose you've got to you've got to uh, have local courts who are sensitive to um, what is sort of acceptable culturally in that area, but listening to the, in particular to the children involved. I mean, if a if a if a young girl insists that she wants a tattoo. Yeah. I mean, after all, if we can say, well, no, 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 you can't possibly insist you can have a tattoo, but we then allow uh, very, very young boys, uh, uh, as young as eight and younger, have um, be castrated and become transgendered. And that looks far more uh, drastic than having a tattoo, which can be removed by laser. Yeah. So these are, there are complications here, and I think that there, will, that there will always be room, unfortunately, for lawyers. <laughs> it is unfortunate. <laughs> I think there'll be more room for smugglers and transport companies. Um, it is better that injustice occur than the world will perish. So there are things worse than injustice, and not everything is going to be solved by contract or law. Sometimes you simply have to, as you pointed out, let people go. In fact, maybe even push them out, but still. Mm. They may have done something wrong, but you're not going to prosecute them. You're not going to... You're just going to go, all right, to, to get out. Yeah. Find your own place. And um, I don't see how you can have contractual or legal agreements that that will be the case, but in the sort of West Australian system, although not with the internal tyranny, you simply... Um, um, during war, it's said you can't have rules of war because it's so desperate, it simply, they simply won't be observed, because they were observed in the first, and even the second world war, by many, many of the commentators. You just yeah. think you just didn't do it. Yeah. It just wasn't on. And in the same way, uh, many of these um, less than libertarian states or societies will say, well, all right, you can go. You can't take your wealth with you, you can't do this, you can't do that, but you can take your, yeah. <laughs> your body out at least. Mm. Michel, uh, is it Fisty Michel? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Following on uh, what this uh, gentleman said earlier about uh, communities living in a certain space and, and what you said about uh, people um, living within borders. Mm. Um, I think this is like thinking, thinking like a state. Um, if you take you know, Weber's definition of uh, yeah. the state having the monopoly of violence, uh, legitimate violence over the area. Yeah. Um, I think that if I am the owner, perhaps, surrounded by people who are communists, Muslims, whatever, Christians, and, and so on. You live in London now. <laughs> 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 and it is, or you could go to Paris. <laughs> that, that's, that's exactly the point. Yeah. In other you know, words, it is my house. Yeah. And I'm not forced to think like my neighbors. Yeah. So um, if I am, and assuming that mm. Catholics would have a way of enforcing what Catholics do, then if I declare that I am Catholic, um, they may enforce that I go to church every Sunday or, or do whatever Catholics do. Yeah. Uh, they may not enforce my neighbor upstairs 
or even the people living in the next room to do this. I think rights apply and obligations, therefore, apply to individuals. They don't apply to men. Really? I mean, I, could, I, could, I don't think many people will opt for a land option. Uh, for most people, um, there'll be fairly liberal rules and they, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, I, you know, I, there are certain parts of town I don't want to live in because I find them a bit dubious for one reason or another and maybe I have young children and I, I'll keep away. But otherwise, not very strong rules. But if people really care about some ideology or religion or such that they want to buy up the land and have rules, I don't see how you can prevent it. I just don't think that there'll be very large communities. As I, I was out in uh, America a couple of years ago and uh, you know, I saw the Amish uh, in Iowa. And I mean, there's just, there are not that many of them. And, um, you know, they, they, there aren't that many people who are so fanatical. They say, no, 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 we want everybody who is our neighbor to be living the same kind of life that we are. And we insist that we buy up the land and, and fill it with people like ourselves. You can, you, you can if you wish to. It's, 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 it exists as a possibility. And it should exist as a possibility, but I don't think many people would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but on the other hand, if I am someone who wants to defect from the community, they cannot seize my property. Oh no! Well, no, 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 yes. no, no! I mean, they have to. But uh, yeah, I mean, they you, they have to put up with you or or buy you out. Yeah. Yeah. Oliver. Then. What about the issue of the American Home Owners Associations, which you know anything about it, can turn out worse than the sort of most busybody of busybody British councils, basically contracted by buying property within our own owners association, and you sign up for rules, but then the rules change. The rules are voted on, the new rules are brought in, uh, you, you're fined for not bringing your, your bin off the uh, any road on big election day. Uh, you're told what grass seed you can have, what kind of you can take my house, and uh, it just goes on and on. So uh, you've contracted in originally, but then these rules change uh, over time because the votes are not. Do you just expect people just have to leave? Comes up there. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you yeah, if you if you join some some club or organisation and and you sort of decide this really isn't working out for me. Then you have to leave. If yeah. you signed up, you sort of contracted. This is my contract, or I sign up for, and then this just changes. It's basically a contract written in more written in. But if the contract is is includes yes. the possibility of change, yes. Yes. Yeah. you know, I mean, obviously there are certain things that it would be unreasonable for them to include in the contract. They don't even need to, like, they can't suddenly decide to enslave. You know anybody that over the age of fifty or or something they, just, they, they have a vote on that. I mean, there are certain things that just they, they would just wouldn't be allowed because uh, they're out on the grounds of just reasonableness. But if they if they, within reasonable understanding of the rules, they can uh, uh, arrive at a situation where you say, "Well, I just hate it here now." Well, you've got to go, go and try and find a better contract somewhere else. Um, but the competition between all the different ones means there ought to be one which is more suitable for you and uh, just because the competition is likely to throw up a diversity which means there's lots of choice rather than uh, a state system which says which, well, which is procrustean these are the rules uh, if you don't like them you've got to leave the country instead you can go to the next block but they do turn they do sort of turn themselves into a sort of state because it's ruled really democratically, you know, and the neighbours decide to change the rules after a time. So after a while, you're just basically basically mob rules where your neighbours decide how you can paint your house or grass you, you can use. Well, you've got to. I I mean, you've got a choice. I mean, you can, you can, don't don't opt in to a system where it has very flexible rules if you don't want it. If you want fixed rules. If you want to live in a, a, a sort of preservation area, which has very strict rules about what can be, what's allowed and what's not allowed, you can opt into that. Uh, 
Or you can, uh, or where there's an uh, external arbiter in the event of unreasonable change in the rules, you can opt in uh, and have that built into the contract. But you, you, if you don't allow, the, the, the main problem with freedom of contract is like you may as well say uh, you can't give somebody liberty because he might do something really stupid with his life. Yeah, he might. But uh, so, uh, it's, it's just the same. Whether democracy will be so popular in the future is another question. Uh, Chapman, yeah. and then uh, just, uh, uh, a comment about uh, Islam and minorities. Mm -hmm. because, uh, I hear really negative points. I have another point of view to share. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, according to me, I think uh, that minorities in Islam are not forced to rule by Islamic law. There's nothing in Islam that force, for example, a Jewish or Christian minority to rule by their own law. And this was the case in the first state of Islam. Uh, in Egypt, or, and with the prophets, Jewish were allowed to have their own tribunals, their own private laws, and this was fine. Of course, it's very difficult to find this today. So for me, it's more a deviation mm -hmm. and a mixture with local traditions that happened to the, to the Islamic world that made it what it became today. So it's nothing, for me, it's nothing to have with the religion itself, and there's no foundation for it. And um, another comment about the uh, ownership of the, the body. Actually, all the, for example, hand cutting or whatever, or other aggressions, mm. are just, in all cases, are just as count as punishment. And I, I don't know what, uh, what are punishment uh, theories in among libertarians, but it's, it's quite a complicated subject. It's, it's not, in any case, a claim of ownership of the body. The basic. The idea is you open your, your body, you're free to do, yeah. and you're responsible of your actions. So nobody's have the right to force you to do what is the right. You have the right to be wrong. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the libertarian, the libertarian issue, as far as I see it here, is there's such a thing as disproportionate um, punishment. And if you say, if you contract into a system, then, and you break the rules, in a sense, Okay, you've got to come into you. But if you didn't contract in, uh, I mean, uh, I think you do have a right to repel burglars from your house with extreme prejudice to, you know, and assume that they're going to do the worst. But um, uh, you can't, for instance, uh, throw hand grenades at small children who are trespassing in your garden. Can't? <laughs> you told me. <laughs> uh, that would be that. So that would be disproportionate. Uh, so there's, 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 there are libertarian limits given that people don't contract in, and that's where there is a libertarian issue. Paul, you still want to talk? Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought you were being a bit politically correct earlier um, when you gave Shame. us. Yeah, I know. When you gave us, but you, you assumed that. Um, you seem that, generally speaking, the rules would be fairly liberal among most things. You thought it'd be quite a rarity that people would bother to buy up all the land to yeah. enforce a particular way of life. Yeah. Uh, and that those people who did would have to pay a lot of costs involved in doing that. Well, I, I think um, if, if, you, if you look at it as strictly as buying up all the land, then yes. But there are other ways you can get your way. I yeah. watched an optimage about Salt Lake City, which is full of Mormons. Yes. And what they do there is that anybody who doesn't go along with the Mormon rules, they just simply ostracise them. They won't speak to you, they won't let you in their shops, they will uh, expose you. People just leave, they either go along with the rules, they play the Mormon part, they don't have to own all of Salt Lake City, but they can get their way by the number of them, just merely by ostracism, that yeah. sort of thing. And I think there'll be a lot more of that uh, kind of uh, voluntary apartheid. Um, yes. And segregation, there'll be a yeah. lot of that because people do like to live in communities where people don't like living shoulder to shoulder with all kinds of aliens and culturally bizarre things. It's it's highly yeah. natural, and the only reason it happens in places like London is because yeah. it's enforced and imposed by yes. the state with their regulations on equality and diversity. And it happens in companies and organizations because they impose the same thing. Yeah. And if you let people uh, choose without this endless oppression of equality being rammed on you from the state, then mm -hmm. people will naturally segregate in different yeah. companies, in organisations, in different areas of land, and I think there will be a huge amount of uh, apartheid. Yeah. And, and then there will also be the mindset that yeah. now a lot of conflict arises because people are compelled to live together in these uh, highly unlikely uh, and imposed sort of communities. Yeah. That's where all these endless sort of petty fucking rules about how you're supposed to get on with people come in. You have this whole bureaucracy about how we'll 
we'll get on. Yeah. People, people, people will be much more happy to live with a lot of things and won't and be seeking all kinds of stated solutions to various mm-hmm. petty problems because they won't exist because they will get on with their neighbours. They won't be radically, you know, yeah. culturally opposed to them like we get them. Because you won't be fighting over yeah. rules yeah, exactly. politically. Uh, yeah. What rules Precisely. should this street be? Because it, it's quite clear who owns it and therefore that whoever and owns what, it. Yeah, we have the Mormon yeah. town, we have this town, we have the, that kind of area. Yeah. Kind of it. And it doesn't have to be done by pure ownership. Can't be done by ostracising. Uh, well, that's a, it's an ownership right to ostracise and boycott. Yeah, I, nobody has a right to your custom or your company or whatever. So yeah. you can just yeah. But that's not the, now. There's all sorts of laws forbidding discrimination. Yeah, offering services yeah. and yeah. employing people. And uh, you also and yes, and absolutely, and, and, yeah, uh, and really. obviously. Obviously, if uh, the Christian uh, uh, bed and breakfast where they didn't want to let homosexuals exactly. in, they exactly. wouldn't have to let them in, or gay club who didn't want to let precisely, straights in, wouldn't have to let them in. Uh, uh, but I suppose I had, I mainly had in mind people who, you know, didn't want to see anybody of, of you know, doing that, whatever that is, yeah. walking around without a chador or whatever. You know, they just didn't want, then they could just, buy up the land but you don't need much you don't need to buy much land i mean you've got a street uh and it's your street and it's gated then nobody's going to come in and annoy you well, by doing those yeah, things well at the moment we have the business situation where in, in pakistan the people there are so obs- you know, seem to have such a worldwide jurisdiction that because some obscure person in california makes a film on the internet yeah the muslims in pakistan burn their own cinema not down. all <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, um, they're, they're fanatics about to do so. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, re- they smash up their own community in protest about what they can't. <laughs> bizarre, bizarre mindset. Yeah. 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 Even, even Parnell was liberal when he used the boycott. <laughs> David? Yeah, I'd say, uh, I mean, the, the, the contracting in land owned gated type community is conceptually a very easy case. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't raise any. A difficult question. Principle. Yeah. The much more difficult situation is, is you, you suppose that London moved towards being a libertarian world. I mean, we, uh, there aren't and there won't be an agreed upon set of contractual rules that govern what you can do in various streets because yeah, it's just all too complicated now. And uh, in that situation, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, because there is a group of people who live in a particular area, they can, through force, impose their particular rules. I mean, that can't be libertarian in any shape or form. So I think uh, if you've contracted in, that's fine. If you haven't contracted in, if you, then I think one has to apply libertarian principles in some fairly pristine form. You have to say that that is libertarian and that isn't. But if you agree to it... If the state goes, then the streets will have to be privatised, which means that we're going to have owners and then there's going to be... It could be some kind of collective ownership or... Something has to be worked out. And ultimately, then that will ultimately decide and there will be a sorting out and there will be some voluntary apartheid takes place afterwards as people say, well, if that's going to be the rule in this street, I'm off. Or vice versa, I can... Definitely stay. Yeah. We've got quite a few words to speak. Oh, you want to speak? Then. Well, um, not such a question, it's an observation that um, people do like to live with their own and they don't like to see this and this and this. On the other hand, people are also hypocrites. <laughs> so I've sometimes thought you could have um, a kind of a, the country divided up into Guardian territory and Telegraph territory, and you'd find that the Guardian people would like to invest in the Telegraph because they make more money. Mm. The Telegraph people would like to have fun in the Guardian part of the country. So, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the same time as the day, perhaps. Yeah. But you get my point. <laughs> yes. Well, you fraternise as much as you wish and are allowed to do. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah. Are you finished, Bob? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Christian, uh, uh, well, just a bit. Oh, sorry, 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 yeah. In fact, there's quite a few before Christian. Okay, Sandler. sorry. Yeah. Uh, this chap here is now, the and then yeah. some other people will say yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, 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 if we if we were allowed to effectively have a free for all in society, then it would move swiftly towards uh, segregation between different groups. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's that's the theoretical. 
I'm not sure that that's very likely to happen, but if you were to get to that stage where people do feel inclined to trade with, to associate with, to live with those who are within like-minded communities, this actually would lead to, uh, I think, two, two different outcomes. One is uh, you would see a, a clear uh, and swift end to any form of progress. progress <laughs> some form of uh, dynamic meritocratic system amongst uh, competing institutions. And once people are segregated, there tends to be rather corrupt, soft, forward-looking kinship groups. You know, you, the usual prey that uh, such high found and they inbred organisations tend to uh, mm. turn into. Mm -hmm. um, and so, secondly, you, you then get a, a, a quick uh, a battle uh, or resource, uh, competition for resources. So, um, I think there would actually be two, two aspects of this. I think, yes, you're going to get those people who wish to segregate themselves, and I think you're also going to get a, a, a competing uh, element, which is that there's a lot of people actually like to live in cities, who like yeah. the element of novelty, who like the element of competition, who like the element of, of the ability to advance themselves against others. Um, I don't think we've probably um, uh, looked at that enough in terms of this potential libertarian outcome is that how we would maintain this sort of these beneficial outcomes within a society where much more is private here. I don't see why if people choose to live in a certain area I mean there's parts of London which are sort of predominantly Jewish for instance mm -hmm. and and they uh, and, and sort of Jewish law is even supposed to apply within certain boundaries as regarded by the Jewish people who live there um, well you can, you can in a sense you could say well that stop there's a, there's a stop to progress there because they're sort of stuck within this well that's and their that's I, their choice I, I said where every everybody yeah. segregates I said oh well no yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I don't. As, well, as I, I go back to what I said, segregation remains an option. But yeah. for most people, um, with there will be certain things that they say, like I don't want on my doorstep certain things happening because they're uh, unpleasant. But apart from that, I'm not worried. I think that's what most people would be like. Um, that's my prediction. But if they weren't, if people did insist on all having their own communities. I don't still don't see why it would necessarily be a problem or progress would stop. Or I it's not a problem, it's a solution if that's what really they like. I mean, if lots of people want to get together and in something called a nunnery, all women living together and praising the Lord all day long. Uh, you know, so, well, it's not much science going on there, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> uh, what, uh, why is it a problem to anybody else? I mean, I, it's... Uh, you still want to speak? If I can, please, yeah. Yeah, so, well, it's your turn now, and then it's yeah. Tristan, and then it's just chapter, and then it's finally... Well, one of the things... Sorry, thank you. Um, one of the things that I've sort of been observing in some of the things that are said is people seem to be talking about things like rights and duties and obligations and rules and laws as if they're real concrete things when really they're just ideas that we've come up with as ways of solving a particular problem which is how do we get along with each other without wanting to bash each other's brains in um, and the real, the real sort of thing about this is that when I make a claim of property what I'm really claiming is that there's a particular relationship between me and the thing claimed that is different and individual and separate from the claims that anyone else can make with respect to that thing. It's kind of like my car. I can make a claim of property on it because I've done certain things to it and with it that no one else can actually say that they've done or they've acquired it in a certain way. Yeah. Um, when, when we're sort of making these, these uh, statements about contracts and people being able to, to buy up land, the person who's buying up the land is essentially making a claim and recognising that claim is a matter of politeness. It's not a matter of obligation, it's not a matter of requirement. If the claim is reasonable and we want to get along with the other person and we want the other person to be able to, you know, to respect our claims, mm -hmm. then we should, as, as a point of meaning, to be able to get along with them recognise it. But if the claim is unreasonable, if the claim is um, something that uh, makes it impossible for us to actually go on and live our lives, 
then we've no obligation to respect it at all. Because if an unreasonable claim doesn't respect us, the, the respect has to be in all dimensions. And yeah. Well, I, your... I wouldn't use the word unreasonable. I, I, I would fall back on the libertarian principle and say, if you can demonstrate that, that, that something that they've done is actually uh, a positive nuisance to you or a proactive imposition to you, uh, then uh, on the grounds of liberty, you can say that it should be set aside in some way. Uh, the classic, uh, or one classic example in the libertarian literature is if somebody buys all the property surrounding your house, can they then say, right, you're my prisoner now because you can't cross my land? Now, obviously, that would be absurd. Um, you know, people should have a right to buy land and live on land, but the idea that you can simply surround somebody and turn them into a prisoner means that what you're doing is actually becoming uh, more than a nuisance to them. You're imposing on them extremely, just as much as if you falsely imprisoned them and locked them up. Uh, therefore, we can say on the grounds of liberty, that shouldn't be allowed. But it would have to be that sort of thing. It couldn't just be, oh, I really don't like what he's doing over there. You know, you've got to somehow show that it, it's a real imposition upon you, like the, the smell, the, the pollution, uh, the noise. Uh, oh, not, yeah. not, I don't like what he's thinking about. I don't like who he's praying to. I, it, that wouldn't be enough. We're not disagreeing with each other at all. We're oh. both essentially saying oh, right. the same thing. Yeah, um, but I would say reasonableness you're, you're it, on it. grounds of liberty. We can do it on grounds of the principle of liberty uh, the, but rather than reasonableness. Reasonableness is, uh, is, is, is a problem because it's too vague. The principle of liberty is a problem because, uh, because that is, we have trouble making that concrete enough as it is. But if you say reasonableness, then people will say, you know, free speech within reason, property rights within reason. What they really mean is whatever I find obnoxious is not going to be allowed. Uh, we've, again, we've lost liberty. It's gone out of the window completely. But again, you're talking about um, property rights and things as though they are real and concrete, uh, where they're not. They're, they're just ideas that we've come up with as solutions to problems, which one of the problems that uh, property solves is how, as physical beings, yeah. living in a physical world, do we... Um, find a way to A, shape the world to suit our wants and needs, yeah. uh, and B, provide for our physical needs. Yeah. Uh, and property claims are sort of respected yeah. because... And avoid clashes what with other that? people. We don't want to be a daggers drawn person, all the, the time. We, the person who's buying up all of the land surrounding yours is essentially reneging on this, this idea that we're going to try and live in peace with each other. Yeah. They are, in fact, doing, making an aggressive act and the act, because of the, the aggression in it, is unreasonable. Uh, so we should we should really look to see why is this reasonable? No, of course. Uh, I mean, the solution is he can buy all the land, but he has to allow you an easement. He has to allow you to come and go without exactly. with, without being imposed on in any particular way. And as long as he does that, there's no problem. Certainly. Just in, so, so, I pass. You pass. Uh, just jump here. Do you still want to speak? Yeah. It's been a long time. I'm sorry about the long okay. queue. Yeah, I, I missed most of your talk, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. Um, but going it's back to the long video, video, by the way. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Surely. But, but just the, 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 the two states that he, he talks about, you know, the one where there's a central authority, I mean, that yeah. to me is odd. You know, that you have a central authority imposing the materialism on people. That's mm. what you think. But in a practical world, um, I think the other state, where other, you know, you can have libertarianism in one place and uh, you know, in another area of the world, one other village down the road wants yeah. to impose socialism or any other ism on their people. You know, that's the only way I can, practical way I can see to actually, for anybody who actually wants to live in a libertarian society, that's the only way forward, in my opinion. Except that the, 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 the second scenario, yeah. the the uh, Federation of Liberty, uh, uh, there could be slavery in these societies. Uh, so, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think that's a... I think... I don't have a problem with that. Sadly, because of I mean, the uh, unusual conditions today, and I'll have to apologise, yeah. but I'll have to buy Patrick uh, a point. Uh, because of the unusual conditions today, I'll have to close the meeting now. I'm sorry at this controversial, but uh, we can continue the discussion now over a drink. 
Outside. Okay, okay. But you've got no time, Patrick. I was going to ask yeah. you why you drink to compensate you for that. You went here earlier for the. Uh, uh, because no. we've got to, we've got to close now. We agreed this time, did we? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, we've got to go. Right. If you understand, thank you very much, please.